Hello and welcome, Namo Buddhaya. And uh, I heard or saw somewhere there's a heat wave in Asia at the moment. Well, I can't uh, argue with that. So if I look a bit hot, it is because it is very hot. But now I'm sitting in this, uh, relatively speaking, cool kuti with a fan and hope to enjoy discussing your comments. And thank you for all of your positive remarks, all of your kind wishes for my upcoming travels. It is of uh, considerable comfort to me to have such ongoing support from this group of people here on uh, this platform, YouTube, as well as those local people here in my immediate environment that support me with food every day. And of course my Sangha back in India. So I pay homage to my uh, holy Sangha brethren back there in India, my teachers, and um, all that have assisted me in being able to be here to practice, to practice what the Buddha teaches us to do, to keep sila, keep our moral virtues, practice meditation and develop wisdom. So that brings me on to the first question which I skipped originally the last couple of days because I didn't quite understand the question but then the gentleman's kindly explained it later. Now, I can't find the explanation <laughs> now, <laughs> so I'll go straight to the question because I did read the explanation. It was my misreading, me my misunderstanding. Uh, the Pani wisdom from, from Samadhi is what this uh, subscriber is referring to. And I um, misunderstood this, so he was referring to what we in the Theravada uh, tradition uh, refer to as Panya, which is the Pali word for wisdom. I'm not sure what Pani is, but I think you mean wisdom. Um, your question really, to sum it up, is please explain how uh, Panya always comes back to samadhi or vice versa. In fact, you use the right way of, of questioning. You're saying, please explain how Panya circles always to meditation samadhi. And then when you explain that in your next uh, comment, you uh, make it quite clear you're referring to wisdom coming from samadhi. Now, circles is correct because it does also circle because samadhi comes from wisdom. Without the wisdom to understand the characteristics of existence, the wisdom to be able to see the uh, necessity, the need and the benefit in maintaining moral virtue, that is keeping sila. And for lay people, that is just five precepts of no killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying or taking of intoxicants. This is also wisdom. Knowing that, understanding that fully, is what allows us to develop samadhi. Through the development of samadhi, through being able to allow the mind to just, with time, begin to settle and become tranquil, as in samatha, samatha, which is tranquility, peace of mind, we develop the ability to have not so much investigative powers, but an investigative nature into the understanding of those characteristics of a nature, impermanence, dukkha, suffering, and anatta, not self. This deep understanding, not intellectual knowledge, understanding of those is true wisdom seen through being able to see clearly 
referred to as vipassana. So this is where samatha vipassana comes from. These two words. Samatha is not samadhi. It is peace and tranquility of mind. Samadhi is focus of attention on one thing. We focus our attention on our meditation object, the breath, which leads us into this tranquil, peaceful state of mind, enabling us to see clearly. Samatha Vipassana. See clearly the nature of how things arise, maybe stay a little while, pass away. As simple as that. From physical feelings to mental emotions. If we have an itch, if we leave it long enough, it will pass. If we have an emotion, if we allow it, it will pass. This is the nature of all conditioned things. Impermanent, uncertain, and in that sense also, when it's applied to the things we love, the things we like, the things we're attracted to, unsatisfactory. This is what we call dukkha, suffering. Because when all of the things we really love end, deteriorate, break, go away, or we are parted from, or those that love us are parted from us through our, inherent, our inheritance of birth, aging, our inheritance through birth of aging, sickness and death, our inevitable demise means all will be parted from us as we are parted from them. This realization is the truth, the true wisdom. So how is it that it always circles back is because these are just words we're using by way of convention to describe the Dharma. And all the Dharma is the, tr is the truth. It is, of course, also referring to the teachings, of the teachings of the Buddha, but the Buddha is teaching us the truth, specifically the Four Noble Truths, as suffering, a cause of suffering, end of suffering, and this path leading to the end of suffering of Sila, Samadhi, Panya. So that's how it circles back. We keep Sila, practice Samadhi, it in turn develops wisdom which further enables us to keep sila, have better samadhi, and really further develop our wisdom until we can become free from suffering in this lifetime, in other words, enlightened. I hope I've understood your question correctly now, and my apologies for not getting to it more quickly, and I appreciate you explaining it in your later comment. Are you, uh, this is referring to my uh, uh, talking about the amount of food I was carrying back. Maybe a little poetic license in exaggeration <laughs> came into my speech then, which wouldn't have been right speech, would it? Um, I think I might have said I'm carrying 50 kilograms back. I mean, I wouldn't say it's far off 25 kilograms in total, because what happens is people tend to offer a lot of fruit including coconuts, king coconuts, which are full of coconut water and they're quite heavy sometimes. And also people like to offer water, which is much appreciated, but of course entails, uh, it adds a lot of weight. So yes, I am carrying back uh, quite a considerable amount of weight, but it isn't all food. And as I explained later, I do get the opportunity, fortunately, to share it. And you've seen another, you've seen Ajahn Martin on his arms rounds in Thailand. He has a lot of helpers. Yes, that is the case. In Thailand, where arms round Pindapata is commonplace, you usually have a lot of followers, upasakas, lay people, who want to serve by way of their dana to the Sangha. So they follow the monks and they collect everything because your bowl is actually filled over and over again, because each and every house only gives you a small amount, maybe a spoonful of rice. But after, you know, a half a mile or let's say a kilometer's walking, your bowl is full, you have to empty it into a, a big bucket or container, and then you carry on. And it is necessary to have that assistance, especially if there's a group of monks 
headed by maybe a very senior Ajahn who's well known, a lot of uh, dana is given, Sangha dana. So you as a, a junior monk, that's me, um, are usually back in the line somewhat, are running sometimes ahead to the senior monks and relieving them of their burden. And then the people behind you, including the lay people, are coming to your assistance also. Now, of course, that doesn't happen here because Pindapata arms round is not commonplace. Uh, in fact, I'm the only person doing it at the moment here in this particular area. So I'm alone and I don't have anyone to assist. But what I do have actually now is the assistance on my return journey. Really virtually every day now, one of the local tuk-tuk drivers brings me back here. So once I've finished my arms round, once I've got to the end of it, in, I go through a village and then to the other side of town, I start to walk back, which actually would mean I would be picking up and collecting a lot more food. This is where it was getting very, very heavy. But fortunately now, as it's also very hot, one of the local tuk-tuk drivers usually stops and comes and says and brings me back here straight back here and they're happy to do that by way of their service their sangadana so thank you for your concern um, but if i don't you know so i do i do struggle a little bit but okay you're trying to follow at home this is referring to chanting from the chanting book that I usually recommend. That's the Watermark Jan chanting book. The link's somewhere here in these comments. Otherwise, ask me for it and I'll send it. Okay, and you're having difficulty following. Yes, you will. I'm afraid you will. I'm sorry, because I don't use that chanting book here in the morning for the chanting. I have a very brief chanting period before a very brief meditation before the blessings. I only really for that time uh, have this, well I have more time in the morning but for practicality for putting it live on YouTube and for the timing of going on arms round I find it's worked out more practical to have a very short meditation uh, prior to that a short chanting, short meditation, short blessings from six o'clock until half past six. So it's only half an hour. So the chanting is about 10 minutes. So I take the, it to be so, the recollection of the nine qualities of the Buddha, the sawas, uh, the, the uh, recollection of the Dharma and the re recollection of the Sangha. And then I use the uh, Sri Lankan devotional chants they use commonly here and followed by the dedication of merits. So they are extracted from that book. So you'd have to skip quite a few pages to find where I'm at. If you just listen and don't try and follow along, you'll pick it up actually and pick from it what I'm saying is just coming from the heart of the main body of those chants. But what you won't see in the What Mark Jan chanting book is those devotional chants because they are particular to Sri Lanka and India. Um, how do you keep yourself clean as a monk? <laughs> can you use things like toothpaste and soap? Yes, we can use toothpaste and soap and that's provided to us. If we're in the forest and the jungle and there's no toothpaste or no soap, sometimes that happens. We are out soup toothpaste for a long time. There's various leaves. If you speak to senior monks that have lived in the forest, the jungles of Thailand for a long time, they'll point the correct ones out. There's various leaves you can use, especially for washing robes, and we only have the robes to keep clean, that are like a detergent. You rub these leaves in the water and they make it all soapy. So they work very well. There's also these sticks that they make tooth sticks out of. They just bash the end so that they fray and you clean your teeth with those. They also have within them some properties to, uh, to um, uh, what's that word? Antiseptical, antiseptic sort of, you know, properties. As a lot of these natural forest materials do uh, so there's these things so you can do that but usually there's an abundance of uh, normal or modern day soap uh, detergent and toothpaste that's offered to the sangha as it is to me here so we're just normal in that respect <clears throat> 14 questions buddha refused uh, 
to answer. Please, can I explain? Well, it's not 14, it's four. <laughs> um, you could break it into 14, um, but there, it's really just the four imponderables. Uh, achintia, so achintia, I think. The four imponderables, which are the origins of the universe, the cosmos, the powers of a Buddha, uh, the, um, the nature, not the nature, the knowing the, the how the results of karma uh, will manifest um, and uh, what's the fourth one and uh, yeah my mind's gone blank but it'll come to me in a minute so by that I mean they say you know you can spend a lifetime and he says in this sutta particularly your head will split in two if you try to understand the origins of the universe uh, where it began and how it will end uh, in terms of um, even scientifically understanding it and even as the Buddha described way before science understood it of universes and cosmologies coming and going well in Buddhist cosmology but universes coming and going through Big Bang and, and implosion and what have you um, that, that it's far greater than that the question um, and if you try to understand it, you can never know the answer, can you? So don't bother, is what he says, because you'll just split your head into it's a waste of time. So that's what we mean by that. Um, as far as the actual insights and powers to the Buddha, only he can know that as a Buddha and as an ordinary human being, unenlightened, we can only find out these things for ourselves experientially when we attain to Nibbana. It cannot be described, all of, all of the powers of the Buddha, so we shouldn't try to uh, understand them ourselves. As far as the mechanics of karma are concerned, we know that if you do good, good things will happen. If you do bad, bad things will happen. But trying to explain as to why sometimes bad things happen when you've only been doing good is again impossible because of course it's relating to previous lifetimes going back eons and eons through universes that have come and gone through all of that time and space and outside of time and space so you know this is one of the this is the third of those imponderables and as i've forgotten the fourth one for now um you'll have to stop there <laughs> i'll have to stop there do you recognize any do I recognize any teaching about the spiral path? No, I don't know what that is. Maybe I... Not that I know of, no. <clears throat> Would I be able to discuss the Wheel of Life? Well, the Wheel of Life is more a, um, a Vajrayana, Mahayana, Tibetan kind of imagery it's uh, it's like these circular mandalas of um showing the realms the heavenly realms the hell realms uh the animal and including all in everything in between from the animal realms human realms it's um a pictorial representation representation of buddhist cos cosmology we don't really go much into that in the Theravada tradition and again, we, as it's something I haven't or cannot remember having experienced or have particular knowledge of, I wouldn't, I could talk about the actual picture, the wheel, show you one and say that is supposed to be that, that's supposed to be that, that's supposed to be that, but that's absolutely got nothing to do with the practice, that's just talking about a, a picture. Uh, my description or interpretation of a picture. Whether these realms actually exist is for us to find out experientially, not to know at the moment, unless we can recall. If we can recall previous lives having been there, fair enough. But then we cannot describe that to someone else. It would entail them believing you. So we'd steer away from belief, uh, and especially in Theravada Buddhism, a lot of this kind of thing can be set aside as an optional extra. Nice, beautiful, also a good way of perhaps training the mind in wholesome qualities if you are not inclined towards meditation. 
but always meditation is the better way to develop the truth of wisdom, the true wisdom, uh, the wisdom of understanding what we can know, what we can experience, and the real characteristics of this life we're experiencing here and now. We shouldn't really be worrying too much about all of the options that come after this life or where we've been prior to this life anymore and we should be too concerned with the future or the past in this life because what is important is what we're doing in the current present moment here and now isn't it it is our actions of body speech and mind now which will determine the outcome in the next moment let alone the next few minutes hours days weeks months years ahead what we're doing now but if we understand that our actions, if kept within the boundaries of sila, will only give us momentum in a positive direction, it is enough. To try and understand and know where we're going exactly is like one of those imponderables I was referring to a moment ago. Dog's getting very excited out there. The, the, the resident dog and the... Uh, visiting dog. Oh no, this is two visiting dogs. Sorry, I'm distracted. Can you recommend a first book to read? Sorry, I'm, I'm new to learning about Buddhism. Can you recommend a first book to read? So, um, I mean, I'm sure everybody's done a Google search on this and, uh, you know, there, is, there are so many books on Buddhism, but there's not really a, a I think and I've never read it or even seen it, but I've heard there's even a Buddhism for Dummies book. Now, I remember that back in the 80s as something to do with computers, computers for dummies or something like that. But there's all manner of books. Now, you know, I don't know on what, how f correct or what, how factual they are, what they're based on, who, who wrote them. As far as, uh, I didn't personally have a first book to read as my introduction to Buddhism. My introduction to Buddhism was meeting monks in a monastery, living as the Buddha had taught monks to live and as monks teach lay people to live. This was how I learned, because there was no belief there. I saw people actually living a very content and peaceful life and teaching me directly, one to one, how to do the same in lay life. And if, want, if I wanted to even go further, and become eventually a monk, as I chose to do eventually. But no one pushed me in that direction. It was a natural progression from my first understanding of the basic Buddhist teachings. So my answer to this question is I can't recommend one particularly, but you should fully understand the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. Wikipedia will explain that to you. Wikipedia is, in a way, a good first book because what you need to do is have a thorough firstly uh, intellectual understanding of the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path but then secondly an actual knowledge knowing of the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path as to how they apply to your life as it is now how you can apply it to all of your daily activities so Books, though, I do always suggest you do read when you can, is, of course, there is the Tripitaka, which is the three books, but within that is the Sutta Pitaka, and within that is perhaps the middle-length discourses, the Majjhima Nikaya. If you need to begin anywhere with the Buddhist scriptures, well, I would certainly encourage that you do begin reading the Buddhist scriptures, that is a place to start but it is quite intense so a way of actually making that a little easier is there's a very good book by uh, Bhikkhu Nyanaloka um, who was a German monk who has written a book called The Word of the Buddha and this condenses the, the Sutta Pitaka into it's still a quite a, a heavy read for a new a person new to Buddhism, but it condenses it into a more readable format. It's not that the suttas are unreadable, but there's a, a lot of repetition and there's a kind of skill to reading them, learning how to read them, 
which you will get used to through the practice of reading the suttas in time. But as a beginner, the uh, word of the Buddha, if you Google the word of the Buddha, Nayanaloka's book comes up. Nayana Tiloka, I mean, sorry. Then I always say, read this chanting book. Like I mentioned earlier, if you look up Google Watmark Jan chanting book, because although it's chanting, if you read the English, if you're English spoken, of course, I'm assuming you are, because of your email, um, if you read the English translation, you'll see that most of the chanting is reflections on the, te of, on the Buddha's teachings and uh, summary forms of the suttas. So uh, the, these are a very good way. And even the paritas, the protection chants, give a lot of explanation to some of the Buddhist, uh, Buddhist cosmology, uh, as we were talking about, and other aspects of Buddhism, which are a little more ethereal. But uh, it's all there in the chanting book. I mean, if you read only ever one book, ever, that would be the one to read. Because if you knew, understood fully, all that's contained in that chanting book, you'll have such a depth of knowledge, sufficient to practice anyway. You've got all the 32 parts of the body for contemplation, death contemplation, anapanasati. You've even got the 12 links of dependent origination. It's all there. Everything is in there you need to know in shortened form and also in a learnable form. Chanting is that because it was the way the Buddha's teachings were taught originally, conveyed ver uh, verbally, not written down for some few hundred years. So the way to remember and convey things verbally is in these stanzas in poetic form, in these chanting formats. So it's a very good way of getting to understand the uh, chanting, the, sorry, the, the teachings of the Buddha. So three books then, the suttas obviously, the Sutta Pitaka, Jnana Loka's The Word of the Buddha, and the Wat Mark Jan chanting book. Any chanting book in your language I'm sure is sufficient. I say the Wat Mark Jan chanting book because I feel it's a very trusted translation. There are, there are other good trusted translations probably may be available to you, but that's available to everyone online. Right. Someone wants to me to reflect more on my uh, overall experience practicing in the Thai forest tradition and a typical day, and also to make a day in the life of style video. Well, actually, I mean, it's an ongoing thing. I continue to practice uh, in the tradition, really, of the Thai forest monks, so the Thai forest tradition, because it is what I'm used to and the way I find my practice is best supported, simplest way of living without too much uh, extra, um, too many extras. So uh, as far as can I reflect upon it, well this is continually what I'm doing on these talks is uh, in the Dharma talks especially I'm, ref I, I'm, I'm talking from experience, my experience coming from living in the way I've been shown by Thai forest monks. So it's a continuing, continual thing. As far as a day in the life style video, I'm not a videographer, a videographer if that's the correct and even a word, um, but if someone was you see, as soon as you start doing something like that, it is not a typical day because you're doing that. My typical day for, for viewing purposes would be extremely boring. So it would have to be edited down to not very much. What I've tried to do in the past and what I will try to do maybe again in the future is for certain parts of the day, and in fact you can find them all on there, you can find already pinned apart, you can even find me sitting down eating my meal, you can find me meditating, you can find me doing Dharma talks at all different times of the day. That's the whole day. If someone wants to edit it into one thing, that's up to them. But I'm not going to do that because that's not what I do, I'm a monk. If anyone else wants to do that, they're very welcome to. And they can come here and do that. And I'll ignore, well, not ignore them, 
But if they want to do that a fly on the wall, they're very welcome to. And I will try to ignore them and carry on about my daily activities uh, as if they weren't even there. And if anyone's interested in seeing that, then all well and good if it's useful. But it's fairly much uh, me sitting meditating, which isn't that interesting for most people, I shouldn't think. But the other bits, yes, uh, someone's welcome to, but I can't really do much of it myself, I'm afraid. Can you show us how monks fold and twist their robes for daily for daily wear? Yes, there is a video um, already there, how to wear monks robes. If you just search that on YouTube, it comes up. Um, and you know, somebody's working in a prison and it's uh, job is sometimes quite unwholesome. So, you know, the job itself, you might not like, or it, I, I would say all that you need to concern yourself about what is unwholesome is what you are doing yourself through actions of body, speech and mind. If your job entails you breaking the five precepts in any respect, then the job is unwholesome. It's not right to livelihood. But from my experience of people who work in prisons, there's nothing required of anybody to break the five precepts specifically, whether you're an inmate or working in the prison. Although these things happen, of course, as in anywhere. So unwholesomeness, you can't blame on the job. That's just your opinion, judgment of the job. In fact, you're doing a job that's required However, it, is, it does say that one, it is considered that locking someone up is uh, against what the Buddha taught. He actually uses those words, jailing, imprisoning someone. But what I think you have to remember in this situation is it's not you doing that. You might have to turn the key of the door, but somebody else has sentenced this individual to the sentence of imprisonment. What you are there to do is to make that easier for them in some respects, and you can do so. And there is a very wonderful organization called the Anguilli Mala Society in the UK, run by a Thai forest monk there, whom he's getting on now, so he may have delegated the responsibility to others, but people visit inmates of prisons and teach them simple meditation, things like this, to help them through their time there. Now, I'm not saying you necessarily have the, uh, you would be able to do that where you are particularly. Now, I don't know quite enough about where you're working to, to suggest what you can do or whom you could contact about that, but you must see it as something that you're doing to, and also exactly what job you're doing in the prison. I mean, if you're providing the people just with their meals or something, then you're feeding people. Now, whatever their circumstances, that isn't your fault. It isn't your karma or bad karma you're generating. Uh, that is still positive karma if you're doing it with the mind of kindness. And then you're asking about, maybe you could talk in your next video about uh, oh, hang on. So you're, you want to talk about Anapanasati and the moment whilst you're quite distracted, especially with this working environment, I suppose, you're using counting. Uh, you know, if you need to use counting to begin, it is a good way of easing yourself in. But it isn't a, it's, a, it's like water wings when you're learning to swim, like floats, or stabilizers learning to ride a bike. It shouldn't be relied upon. Ultimately, you should be able to take off the water wings, take off the stabilizers, and just swim or ride the bicycle freely. So just enjoying the breath. 
So just keep practicing, that's all I can say about that. And you're asking me to say how Anapanasati, what kind of effects it has on the mind and the body. Well, I mean, this is the whole nature of these talks, is about this meditation. Uh, uh, now, I describe other aspects surrounding it in relation to sila and the development of wisdom from samadhi. And as we just said at the beginning, this, circ this interrelational aspect of all of these lists in a way, sila, samadhi, panya, um, and all of the other lists, the Noble Eightfold Path, the Four Noble Truths, everything's dependent on something else. Now, of course, we develop through anapanasati, being able to just observe the breath as a meditation object, and it could be any meditation object. I always refer to anapana breath, the breath as a meditation object, because it is the most practical, it is always with you. You can always bring your attention, your awareness back to the breath, whatever's going on around you. And therefore, remind yourself, perhaps, of calmness, tranquility, peace that you had when you were meditating, watching the same meditation object. It's like a comforter, always with you. So try to see the breath as that, enjoyable, on its own, without the necessity for counting, labelling, noting. Just seeing the breath long, short, deep, shallow, warm, cool, all of its aspects in its nature as you breathe in, as you breathe out. Let this settle, allow the mind to settle and become calm, the body to settle and become relaxed of its own accord. And this is all you need to do. So that's the nature, that's the effect it has on the mind, that's the effect it has on the body. Ultimately, peace and tranquility of mind, relaxation, comfort and painlessness of the body. He's working as a bagger. I thought it said beggar at first, but it's bagger. This is someone who puts all the stuff in the bags at the end of the, the, the bit, I think, where you pay. That sells meat, alcohol and bug spray. Wrong livelihood. No, it's not. Is it wrong livelihood if you're directly selling and trading in such things as opposed to working for a company that does? If you're directly trading in alcohol or directly selling, yes, bug, uh, sprays that kill bugs, then yes, that would be wrong livelihood because you're selling something to someone that's going to do them harm or others harm in both cases. Selling meat is specifically uh, identified, uh, well, butchery, I suppose, as opposed to actually generally selling meat as a, as a not right livelihood as a prohibited, if you like, uh, livelihood. But what you're doing, putting things in bags that have already been bought, is by no means affecting your karma. This is, uh, you're helping people, maybe old people who can't do that themselves, get all their shopping in their bags. You're doing a good job, carry on, it's no problem. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, we're, we are the heirs, uh, we are responsible for our own karma and the heirs to our karma. Whatever goes in that bag is not as a result of any of your actions of body, speech and mind. You're just putting objects, whatever they may be, in a bag. It isn't for you to intervene as to whatever it is you're putting in the bag. In fact, I would suggest watching the breath as you're doing this. You don't need to think too much about what you're putting in the bag. You'd be better off not thinking, watching the breath, using this as a very good kind of work activity that requires very little thought. Just a case of putting the fragile things in one bag, the cold things in another bag, the things that don't matter in another bag. You know, nice kind of work, sort of work I enjoyed when I got out of all my career before I could become a monk, just simple, practical, helpful jobs that help others that require no thought so you can keep all of your attention all of your thought all of the time on the breath breathing in breathing out the more you're doing that throughout the course of the day the more peaceful and tranquil your mind will become and the more clearly it will see developing that wisdom again <clears throat> thank you very much for that how can I make donations? I think that's just to find the links on the um, channel description uh, page. Thank you, Enamodana. 
Ah, this is a very good suggestion. I won't read the whole email. Uh, could I make a playlist of top 10 videos for beginners? Must watch for beginners. So it's going back to that Buddhism for beginners thing. What I've done, <laughs> I mean, I'm not, again, it's, uh, I spend as little time as possible behind the scenes. Uh, I don't mind my, as much time, as, uh, but as much time as possible speaking to you now. After this, there's nothing much required of making these talks. So I try to do as little that would interfere with my practice after this as possible. But actually making a simple playlist, I discovered, is quite easy. So, but I have cheated. Because it, uh, you're referring to in order to answer the most commonly asked questions. What I did is I sorted the videos into the most popular in that order. So the most, as in the most viewed, so the most popular video, it happens to be one on, you know, the basics of how to sit or how to, uh, how to meditate, you know, these kind of basic Buddhist questions. Um, the most popular videos seem to be right up there, th those ones. So <laughs> I've just put the first 10 of those um, on a playlist here on this channel called mm, Basic Buddhism, I think, something like that. They're still on their original playlists, but there is a new pay playlist. But it doesn't mean, I think anyone can do that with these. I th don't think there's, there's no restrictions. Anyone can make playlists, make their own channels out of this content if they wish. It's up to them. There's no need, but you can. Um, but I'm afraid I can't go through all of the videos and remember, as you quite rightly said, there's rather a lot of them an overwhelming number. The number isn't that great. It's less than one a day. Certainly well less than that. It's only a few a week. It looks like there's more because there's lots of shorts, but they're only from the main videos. Outtakes, if you like, trailers. But the the actual videos, there's, there's not so many, but even from that, I can't remember what I said in each one. And I'm afraid my titles are a little bit ambiguous on occasions. I apologize for that. I'm trying to get them a bit more accurate to the content. But sometimes even straight afterwards when you quickly put the title it's hard to remember what you talked about. So um, yes, by, I found a good way of doing that. The most popular, it seemed to throw right up to the top the, the subjects you're referring to. Um, and what are quite basic. So we'll see how that goes. How to sit on the floor, how to sit for a long time. Anapanasati, all of these things. So we're just, uh, I'm working on it. If there's things, these suggestions like that, I do welcome them and your assistance is much appreciated. Someone from a chanting video quotes a little number and actually it's amazing. If you click the number, it goes to that video from the comments. I didn't know that, but I did that and it did that. So that, what is this chant? It's Bhavatu Sabha Mangalam, uh, which is usually following Sabitiyo uh, Vivajantu and Abhiwadana Silisa and then the next one starts with Bhavatu Sabha Mangalam page 148 of the Wat Mark Jan chanting book these are the Anamodana chants, the blessing chants I actually chant these at the end of every morning chanting if you look at uh, today or yesterday's live chanting video I say the most recent because it is something you improve upon each day as you're doing it. Uh, when I began, when I first got to this location, they're, they're really quite not so good. But now I'm not lighting so much in the way of incense because they were making me cough a lot. And um, I got used to this environment. So the chanting has become a little bit more relaxed and more fluent. So. If you listen to the more recent, you can hear that, that those are at the end and what I'm referring to. <clears throat> okay. So they're quite long. Uh, will, the, uh, will the guided meditations return? I th hope when I come back, when I return here and the weather's 
the evenings the weather starts to begin to to change then yes i do intend to reintroduce and also now i've worked out how to get internet onto the phone more easily i do intend to reintroduce guided meditations short so like in the morning format with meditation but a longer period of meditation maybe a little chanting to warm it up but then a guided meditation on occasions perhaps once a week is sufficient every friday evening or something like that uh it does require because of meditation by nature of its you know and going to be 40 minutes or an hour it does require quite a lot of data for for nothing if you see what i mean there's nothing for someone to watch so i've refrained from doing it until i could find a way of putting data on the phone easily which i've now found so now we can do that this will return hopefully be reintroduced when i return here to sri lanka in a few days hopefully a few days time i i don't know how that's going to go this uh um yeah once i leave here on uh saturday afternoon i don't know how it's going to go <laughs> that's all i can say about that one doesn't as you're a monk you've got no money you just have a ticket you get on a plane and hope that everything comes to fruition at the other end then i have to uh, apply i'm going to hope my old sim card works because this is all online stuff otherwise i have to find wi-fi but i have to apply for my um visa to come back here the original original plan was something different but that uh, hasn't quite worked out so um that's not important what is important is it shouldn't is that it shouldn't be a problem for me to return quite quickly okay I think that's uh sufficient talking for today. Once again, I very much appreciate all of your comments and the questions you attach to those. It is very supportive. It is very comforting and it is uh a very wonderful form of dana you're offering me in that respect. Uh just watching, listening, accompanying me in what I'm doing here albeit from a very short part of my day uh it is very reassuring to know that I have people to be able to share uh my rather long day with on these occasions so as long as I can I will endeavor to try to do this and with your support together we can move forward towards developing our practice and closer towards our final goal of freedom from suffering in this lifetime and ultimately nibbana so thank you for watching until next time be happy and stay well sukhi hotu